Los Angeles in the mid-80s was a breeding ground for glam metal bands, with its sunset strip populated by groups like Motley Crue, Rat, and Poison. The city was a total kaleidoscope of leather, hairspray, and debauchery. And Guns N' Roses emerged from the grit of this environment with a much rougher, unpolished sound. Guns N' Roses formed in 1985, a lineup of five outcasts, Axl Rose on vocals, Slash on lead guitar, Izzy Stradlin rhythm guitar, Duff McKagan bass, and Steven Adler on drum. And each member brought something unique to the band, making them stand out from the polished, glam-obsessed bands of the time. The early shows at venues like the Troubadour and the Whiskey A Go-Go solidified their reputation as the wildest band on the strip known for their insane live performances and offstage antics. But before they became legends, each member of Guns N' Roses had a story that was far from glamorous. Axl Rose, born William Bruce Rose, came from a troubled background in Lafayette, Indiana, where he endured a traumatic childhood that fueled his volatile, rebellious personality. Axl moved to L.A. in the early 80s, struggling to make a name for himself in various short-lived bands before meeting Izzy, his longtime friend and musical partner. Slash, born Saul Hudson, had a similarly unconventional upbringing. Raised in both England and Los Angeles, he was introduced to the rock lifestyle through his mom, a costume designer for stars like David Bowie. Slash's early fascination with the guitar and blues-based rock gave him a unique style, one that contrasted with the flashy guitar solos of his contemporaries in the 80s. He quickly found his place alongside Rose and Stradlin, adding a rougher edge to the group's evolving sound. Duff McKagan from Seattle brought a punk rock sensibility to the band. His experience playing in numerous punk bands influenced Guns N' Roses' aggressive, street-smart approach to rock music. Steven Adler, the final piece of the puzzle, was a childhood friend of Slash's. Though his technical abilities were sometimes criticized, Adler brought an essential energy and looseness to the band, which complemented their chaotic live shows. The Sunset Strip in the mid-80s was a melting pot of hard rock and glam metal bands, but Guns N' Roses didn't fit the mold. Where Poison and Motley Crue embraced the flamboyant excesses of glam rock, Guns N' Roses had a rawness. They dressed in ripped-up jeans and leather jackets and boots. Their attitude was decidedly more punk than glam. And it wasn't long before they earned a reputation for being unpredictable, both musically and personally. In clubs around the area, such as the Whiskey A Go-Go and the Troubadour, they would deliver blistering sets, often fueled by drugs and alcohol. Axel, in particular, was infamous for his onstage outbursts, ranging from confrontational tirades to storming off mid-set. And this volatile energy, while alienating to some, also made Guns N' Roses irresistible to others. They're dangerous, unpredictable, and authentic. Qualities that resonated with a disillusioned audience that was just tired of the slick, manufactured acts that were dominating the strip. And while their live shows earned them a loyal following, Guns N' Roses' offstage antics were equally notorious. The band members lived in a state of near destitution, crashing on friends' couches and scraping by on whatever money they could scrounge from gigs or side hustles. Drugs were everywhere, fueling the chaos that surrounded the group. But despite these struggles, or even perhaps because of them, the band's bond grew pretty strong, and the music really became an embodiment of that life. Raw, dangerous, and unapologetically real. So by 86, Guns N' Roses had built a pretty good following, and their raw, gritty sound caught the attention of Geffen Records. Tom Zutat, an A&R rep at Geffen, saw the potential in the band's unruly energy, and so he made the bold decision to sign them, even though Guns N' Roses was far from a safe bet. In fact, even getting them to record their debut album would prove to be a monumental challenge. And the band was actually reluctant to enter the studio, partly due to the lifestyle, which was spiraling deeper into chaos, and partly because of the DIY ethos they cultivated. The music wasn't polished, and they weren't sure how to translate the raw power of their live shows into a studio album. But nevertheless, Geffen Records was determined to make it work. They brought in Mike Clake to corral the band in the studio and help them channel this chaotic energy into something cohesive. Now, Mike Clink had worked with Triumph and Whitesnake, and he was known to be pretty good about striking a delicate balance between the band's need for creative freedom along with that structure that they need to be able to actually complete an album. And the band ended up liking his no-nonsense approach. But 
as the record company would give the green light to record, it became clear early on that this wasn't going to be a straightforward process. The band was unpredictable, there was a whole ton of conflicts, and at times everything was just totally chaotic. I mean, during this time, Slash was actually deep into his heroin addiction, so it wasn't uncommon for him to disappear for days on end. The band would go in the studio ready to record, only to find that Slash was nowhere to be found. And sometimes he would show up just as mysteriously as he had vanished, looking worse for wear but insisting he could still play. And interestingly enough, later on, it would actually turn out that Slash was a real stickler for being timely to sessions. But in order for that to happen, he'd have to get past the drugs. But despite what was going on, Slash's guitar work was exceptional when he was able to focus. His playing during the recording sessions was both raw and electrifying, but getting him to channel that energy into cohesive takes was a constant struggle for the producer. Steven Adler, very similarly, was plagued by drug issues. His loose, carefree drumming style had been pretty much a hallmark for the band's early sound. But as his addiction got worse, his performance also began to suffer. The band was really getting frustrated with his erratic behavior as well. He'd often be late or completely absent from the recording session. But in terms of focus, Axl Rose really had it. Even though they were all pretty much living the hedonistic rocker lifestyle, Axl was pretty obsessed and really focused on making sure every element of the debut album was perfect, often to a fault. The band saw his perfectionism often being a detriment to their progress. He would demand countless takes of a single vocal line or stop a session entirely if something didn't feel right to him. And on numerous occasions, he would butt heads with Slash, who at the time had more of a laid back improvisational approach. But still the source of tension was also what would make Guns N' Roses such a compelling group because you could feel that tension in their music. Things really came to a head during the recording of Sweet Child of Mine because Rose really became fixated on a minor detail in the delivery of one particular line. So he just went after take after take and even Mike Clank, the producer, was losing his patience. Eventually, Axel just got frustrated and stormed out of the studio leaving the rest of the band to continue without him. And these kind of walkouts were not uncommon for Axl Rose, whose temper was as legendary as it came for a rock singer. And even though Mike Clank had all that experience, nothing really could have prepared him for the whirlwind of personalities and dysfunction that he encountered with Guns N' Roses. You know, with this group, he couldn't enforce things like studio management or setting schedules, maintaining some form of discipline and sticking the deadlines. It just wouldn't work. So he had to really adapt. He just learned how to work around Slash's disappearances and Axel's perfectionism. But Mike Klink had a knack for knowing kind of when to push the band members and when to back off. And so it was like he was pretty much just teasing the best performance out of them that he possibly could using any methods that he could get away with at the time. And another source of tension, too, was kind of some of the differences in the backgrounds that they had. I mean, Axl Rose had a grand theatrical vision for the group. He was really into Queen and Elton John. So he really wanted the debut album to be epic, larger than life, with more complex arrangements and dramatic shifts in tone. The Slash, on the other hand, was more interested in keeping things simple and raw, drawing more from the blues and punk rock. He wasn't really into the grandiose embellishment. Izzy, on the other hand, would find himself caught in the middle of these battles, and his approach to songwriting was kind of more minimalist and straightforward, heavily influenced by punk and early rock and roll. But he was pretty much content to let Slash and Axel just battle it out where he just focused on crafting the skeleton of each song. And like Izzy, Duff McKagan was also caught oftentimes between Axel and Slash's creative tug of war. But the main thing that the entire group collectively didn't want was to sound like the other bands that were dominating the Sunset Strip at the time. They didn't want the bubblegum lyrics and the radio-friendly production. And so the band, in order to achieve their sound, would spend months rehearsing and writing songs, often tweaking material that they had performed live. They wanted to go into the studio as tight as possible and still pretty much play everything live in order to translate that energy to tape. And meanwhile, Mike Klink would cleverly have them layer their guitars in a certain way with that kind of wall of sound thing with really thick layered production emphasizing the guitar and the drums, making songs like Welcome to the Jungle and Night Train just pop right out of the speakers. Starting the album off is Slash's delayed guitar lick, which opens up Welcome to the Jungle. And this was the perfect introduction to the band's dangerous persona. As the music starts getting kind of moody and melodic, you could hear that slow building scream from Axl Rose, and then all of a sudden it just blasts. And the lyrics were inspired by Axl Rose's first experience in LA. Story has it, 
he was out on the streets and this guy just looked at him and said, you're the jungle baby, you're going to die, which ended up becoming one of the most famous lyrics in any song by the group. And for listeners who were just getting introduced to this band, this was a song that would just hit them right upside the head. More menacing and exciting than anything that was out at the time in a lot of ways. It borrowed from punk in the earlier days, but it had this whole other kind of aggressive raw edge to it. And what's also interesting is that during the solo, you could hear Slash's blues influence coming out where it almost starts off with kind of this old school blues. And then he just lights it up and goes crazy for a while. Next up, it's so easy with that punk sounding bass starting it out. And then the band just starts churning in with Axel with his low baritone side. Of course, Axel had two sides to his vocal. He's either screaming like a banshee or singing really low and menacing. And for this one, he goes all out lyrically. It is Guns N' Roses at their sleaziest, but it's also pure high-energy rock and roll. A real standout on this track, Night Train, is a tribute to a California wine, Night Train Express. The band liked it because it was cheap and it knocked them on their ass. The Slash had pretty much said that they had come up with the song on the spot. He and Izzy just started jamming it out in the practice room and Duff joined in and it just worked. But they still didn't have lyrics for it, and so the group found themselves walking down Palm Avenue sharing a bottle of night train when somebody yelled at them hey i'm on night train so axel started saying bottoms up fill my cup and so it stuck and the verses are menacing with the lyrics i'm a west coast druggie one bad mother the song is just a grinding four four and to this day it's an anthem that gets the crowds going in a similar vibe out to get me kind of takes the point of view from somebody who claims that they're innocent. It's got paranoia written all over it. Axel had said the song's about getting in trouble, but still handling it. And the song's about the cops breaking down the door one night looking for Axel on a bogus charge, apparently. It starts off with Izzy's intro, just this growling double stop lick. Slash loved it the moment that he heard it. And it was another one of those songs that just came together pretty much in no time. And then Mr. Brownstone, another total standout on the album. This one actually started with Slash and Izzy sitting around Izzy's apartment complaining about their addictions to heroin, or which they called Brownstone. And one of them wrote, I used to do a little, but the little wouldn't do it, so the little got more and more, on the back of a grocery bag and gave it to Axel. And of course, he ran with it. But rhythmically, this is one of the most unique tracks on the album. There's some wah scratches in there, coupled with Adler just kind of going wild on the toms, and then a bit more of a complex guitar riff, but through those snarling Marshall stacks, makes the song really light up. And then Axel in deep voice mode comes in, very menacing, singing pretty much about the effect of being completely strung out. This features one of Slash's more smoldering solos throughout. Next up, Paradise City, another one of their most popular songs, starting off with a mellow, clean guitar, but not fully clean, Basically, it's full gain, but with the volume turned down. And then all of a sudden, you could just hear that volume kick right in. They start building it up, and then it is on with one of the more menacing guitar riffs. But also in the beginning is that chorus, Take Me Down to the Paradise City where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. And right from the get-go, it is an obvious anthem. And what's interesting about this one is that it's got that relatively straightforward groove, but then at the very end, they start going double time, and they just keep building up the intensity and building it up. Duff McKagan throws in some really cool bass runs in there, which just help it build up with the intensity. All the while, Axl Rose does some pretty wild ad-libbing over the top. And then starting out side two, back when albums used to actually have two sides, My Michelle. And Slash had actually modified his guitar setup for this. Throughout most of the album, he was playing the Les Paul, but for this one, he was playing the Gibson SG, which just totally fit right for the song. And it was actually about Michelle Young, who Slash knew in junior high. She was a friend of his girlfriend at the time. And Axl Rose happened to be hanging out with Michelle Young, listening to your song by Elton John. And so she looked at him and said that she wished that she had a song somebody wrote about her. So Axel thought he'd come up with this really nice, mellow, romantic tune for her. But he wasn't digging it, so he ended up rewriting it. And it was about Michelle. But instead, they touched on all the drug addiction and the death of her mom and her dad working in a questionable industry. You know, the one with films and all that good stuff. And they were really nervous about bringing the song to her, but she loved it. She actually really liked its honesty. And musically, it is just pure hard drive and rock. It's got a cool descending chromatic line where Axel's screaming vocal follows it. 
and it just sounds like it's going off the rails musically, totally fitting the lyrics. The chorus is almost like too happy, almost like smartass in a way, where he says, well, 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 my Michelle. It's almost too resolved, but that's really the punk side of Guns N' Roses as well, so it totally fits. And this song really features some of Axel's wildest vocal work on record. And then there's Think About You. A lot of people really like the song. It's kind of a semi-ballad. It's kind of one of those songs that, like, every album has that song that's just kind of an odd fit. And this one was just kind of an odd fit on the album, but only slightly. I mean, it still has the Guns N' Roses sound. It's just a bit more on the melodic side. Not a complete standout, but it's still a great track nonetheless. And then Sweet Child of Mine, the song that completely landed Guns N' Roses on the map. And this is a ballad where they threw everything in, starting off with a very catchy intro from Slash, which he had come up with, actually as a guitar exercise. And he was sitting around playing it in the studio, and Axel's like, we really got to do something with that. And so they did. Duff McKagan came in and wrote one of the coolest, most melodic bass lines to it. And it really kind of highlighted the chord progression that would come, that would be able to follow it, where Slash was able to kind of mutate the notes a little bit to follow the chord progression underneath. And the main line is like a master class in guitar melodicism. Axl Rose put some really reflective lyrics to it. And it was written about his girlfriend, Erin Everly, who is actually Don Everly's daughter from the Everly Brothers. And he also drew on some inspiration from Leonard Skinner as well. And you can hear it slightly in the song for sure. And what's interesting also is that during the choruses, Slash again morphed that main lick at the beginning to follow a completely different chord change. So it's a nice revisiting of the main line. And the solos are extremely melodic, where he plays this really simple catchy line in D major, but later on it changes to the key of E minor and he starts getting more of a harmonic minor vibe before it totally picks up in intensity. And he goes into the E minor pentatonic wah-wah. And for that one, is just pure slash all the way. And the band had actually demoed this before it had gone on the album. And in one part, they were just playing the last part over and over again with the music had changed. And Rose just kept saying to himself, well, where do we go? And Spencer Proffer, who had actually produced Quiet Riot's album, was there. I said, well, why don't you just sing that? So sure enough, it ended up being a catchy hook at the end of the song. But see, it's another one of those songs that actually proves that it doesn't have to be a conventional arrangement to be a huge hit. And then they light it up with You're Crazy, which is actually an older song of theirs. They used to do it more slow. And there's also the acoustic version on Lies, which sort of shows that tempo. But on this one, it is fast-paced, all-out, punk rock goodness, followed by Anything Goes, which is one of their oldest songs at that point. And then finally, Rocket Queen, which has probably the most famous story for the recording of this album. It was inspired because Axel wanted to write a song for a girl that he knew who was forming a band, and she wanted to call the band Rocket Queen. But Axel, being the visionary that he was, wanted some sex sounds happening in it. Now, Steven Adler happened to have been dating this groupie and stripper who hung around with the group named Adriana Smith. And they'd been going out for about a year by that time. And they had a little spat where Adler basically said, hey, I don't want you calling me your girlfriend. Well, she got really upset. So she ended up going and popping into the studio and Slash and Axl Rose happened to be there. And this was right around the time that Rose is like, hey, I would really like to get these sounds during a Rocket Queen. And so he propositioned Smith and said, hey, you know, come join me in the vocal booth and let's really make the sounds for it. And so she said, yep, for a bottle of Jack Daniels and for the band, I will do it. So the engineer and his assistant, Vic DiGlio, went ahead and set up some microphones in the vocal booth. They called it like a Ron Jeremy type set. And so they proceeded to go at it. But at one point, things got so rough that they ended up knocking over the microphone. So while all of this was happening, Victor had to go in there and actually adjust the microphones. And the main engineer, Michael Barbiaro, didn't want to have anything to do with this. That's why he just went ahead and set up the microphones and was like, all right, Vic, uh, this one's all yours, buddy. But nevertheless, they pulled it off. Interestingly, it was over a really tasty slide solo that Slash was doing. But the entire thing worked. So despite all the obstacles, Mike Clink and the band managed to push through the turmoil to finish the album. The final weeks of it were particularly grueling. Long hours and intense pressure to get everything done and right. But they were ultimately able to rally around the shared goal of finishing this darn thing already. 
But by the time that final mix was done, it was clear to everybody that Appetite for Destruction was definitely something special. It ended up getting released on July 21st, 1987. And initially, it didn't get a lot of attention. It was kind of more underground. Radio stations were a bit reluctant to play any of the music. Early sales were really sluggish. But the first one to really kick it off was Welcome to the Jungle when it was played on MTV. A lot of people were just like, what the hell is this? And they really took notice. But then not long after that, Sweet Child of Mine became a massive hit. And then boom, it shot straight up to number one by the end of 1988. Worldwide, the album sold over 30 million copies, making it one of the best-selling albums of all time. But of course, his success would come at a cost. The tensions in the group had simmered during that recording process, and they would just grow as they continued to embark on grueling tours. Adler would eventually find himself kicked out of the band and they would get embroiled in an ensuing legal battle. But despite all of it, the album remains monumental achievement in rock history. It established the band as one of the biggest in the era and also it changed the face of rock music, bringing in much more of a raw, dangerous edge back to a scene that had really become dominated by this almost poppy glam metal. Something really weird, I just found out the most expensive guitar on Amazon is a signature guitar, and you won't believe whose signature guitar it is. I left the link below in the description. And to my subscribers, I really want to thank you so much for all the inspiration and feedback. I truly do appreciate it. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, make sure you smack that subscribe button. While you're at it, hit the like button, join the family, and want to thank you so much for watching.